Okay, hi guys, welcome. My name's Peter Morton. I'm doing my PhD in robotics at the Australian Centre for Field Robotics in Sydney, at Sydney Uni. Um, so today I'm talking about TCP, Bonjour and Bluetooth, so all solutions for connectivity and for communications. So I started out messing around with electronics when I was pretty young and the limit I hit when you start messing around with electronics is you find you want to be able to program things more. So you want the hardware to be able to do more logic than you can embed into the hardware itself. So I started off pretty early with, this is a parallel port kit from Dick Smith's. So this is like a massive, whatever, 25 pin connector that you connect up to your computer. And that was a good way to start. It's actually how I learned to program. I started QBasic with that thing. So that was pretty cool. Um, on the way, I've messed around with, this is an Arduino board, um, stuff I had lying around. And these are XB radios. So these are all you know, different ways of communicating between devices and your computer. This is another, this is a, like a university project. We made a, a Jaffa firing cannon that's shooting, yeah, so it's shooting Jaffas at a target over there. And it's tracking it. Um, so this is pretty fun, but so the most frustrating thing about this whole project was communications. We had one computer that was running like our visual system to do the tracking, and then it was communicating to like an embedded processing board that was then actually doing the controls. And yeah, the most headaches in all of that was actually getting reliable communications between one and the other. So communications isn't fun in general, I've found. So over time, uh, especially now that I've started my PhD, devices that I'm using as my controllers are getting smaller and smaller. I'm using my iPhone now, and the robots that I'm controlling are getting bigger and bigger. We have the obligatory anvil drop animation. Um, that's, that's my robot there, or one of our robots. It's called Shrimp and Mantis. These are um, autonomous sensor platforms. So they're four-wheeled skid steer vehicles. Uh, that basically carry a whole pile of sensors. So we've got cameras and lasers and radars on top, and we drive them around, and we're doing, um, yeah, we're doing our research into perception using these platforms. So as part of this, um, I've developed an iPhone app to drive these things around, and that's a pretty handy way of using the robots. So on the way, I've learned quite a lot of lessons about how to try and use communications tech to make things that are reliable and safe. So when I'm talking about communications, I'm mostly coming from the background of like a controlling unit and then a robot or like, um, yeah, a computer and some piece of hardware. But there's also a lot of applicability here. So you might have computers and peripherals like sensors or something like that, or it might just be device to device. So we're talking about you can do this kind of communications might be relevant for communicating between your iPad and your laptop. So the three technologies we're talking about today uh, sockets, so TCP stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about Bonjour, uh, which we'll explain what that is later. And then the final one is Bluetooth Low Energy. So that's a new uh, Bluetooth spec that's been included on the latest Apple devices. And I think that's pretty exciting for the sort of potential, particularly in robotics area. Alrighty, so sockets. Everyone should know something about sockets. Everybody's definitely using them all the time. So it's a network. It's the backbone of the internet. So it's IP protocol or the internet protocol rather, and your socket address might look something like this. So we've got a host identifier, and then we've got a port number. Hopefully this isn't surprising to you. So TCP is a common protocol. This is used for most of the internet uh, kind of stuff, like HTTP requests are going over TCP. So they're all about guaranteeing that you get the data and you get all of the data. And then another way of communicating is called UDP. And this is more for like streaming video or say uh, VoIP or yeah, Skype, that kind of thing, where you, you care about getting the data quickly, but sometimes you can afford to drop packets. So I'd, I'm not going to go into any detail here just to say that they exist. And if you're actually looking at port numbers, so here our port number is 8080. Anything below 1024 is privileged and they're reserved for use by the operating system. Um, so some common things like SSH runs on port 22. HTTP browser requests port 80, FTP port 20, there's a whole bunch of different commonly used ports. But that's not really the point here. Can I get a show of hands who's actually used Netcat before online? Okay, not that many, so that's interesting. Netcat is, yeah, it's a Swiss Army knife of TCP IP. It can be used for everything to do with um, socket stuff. That's a pretty fun way to or just mess around with, get an understanding of how sockets work. So we've got two examples here. We're starting a, a Netcat server, and we've got a, a client here. So in sockets, 
there's always a client, which is something that establishes a connection and then waits for other devices or other computers to connect to it. And then you run a client, and you run a client, you tell it where the server is running, and then you give it the port number, and you establish a connection. Once that connection's been established, there's no, uh, the flow of information is two ways. So you can send data from the client to the server or from the server to the client. So we can actually like just get a quick demo of going of Netcat if you haven't seen this before. So we're going to jump across the terminal. So I'm just going to run some local communications. So typing exactly what we showed before. We've got Netcat started here. Uh, local host. OK, so both of those terminals are running something. If I just type hello now, this is going to appear in the other terminal. So you can see this is. You know, there's, there's not very much work involved here. I've just started a client, I've started a server, I'm getting text transfer. Um, does anyone have their laptop out on the Wi-Fi network that wants to try and connect to my server? Is anyone? Okay, so if anyone's got a laptop. Can we go, so my IP address is going to be, well, let's see if it works. So pm-air.local. Try and use that as the um, IP address. Yeah. So it'll be Yep, we've got someone else in there. Was that? Yes, okay, excellent. So you see that's that's again pretty simple. And I've just gone from local connection to someone else somewhere in the room. Um, yeah, without any work. And literally no work. This is a command line utility. <laughs> I'm gonna have to be careful. I'm gonna close this before it gets abusive. That's uh, <laughs> This is the way these demos always go, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so sockets are pretty handy, um, and we use them all the time. So our Segway robots that have all those sensors on them, we're constantly streaming information between a controlling computer, the sort of sensor data and stuff like that, and control information, and that's all just going over sockets. So they're really quite simple in some respects. But actually doing low-level socket stuff in your app using C APIs is a massive pain, and I can tell you that because I've done it, say? So. Yeah, you know that. <laughs> so, well, again, my focus is not telling you too much about how to do this, so I'm just going to say um, that there's some big issues to do with blocking, so sockets, and you know, we want our data to be asynchronous. So we want just to know when we've received data, but we don't want to hang there and wait for it all the time. So that's a pain, of, that's a thing to deal with. Also, buffering, if you send like hello across the socket, there's a chance you'll get a HE transmitted and then a LLO transmitted later. And dealing with that and joining everything together is work that I don't want to do. Um, so here's one library that I found pretty handy. I'm sure there's many others, but this is called Coco Async Socket. Um, so you can plug this in pretty simply and it'll handle a lot of these tedious issues. And it does nice things because um, Everything is done as events or delegate callbacks. I think it can also use Grand Central Dispatch, but I haven't played with that yet. Um, so basically, you just tell it you want a connection, and then you just use an event-driven framework to actually deal with it. So we're going to start, do a demo of the same kind of thing that we're just doing with Netcat, doing it inside an iOS app. So it's going to... OK, so we've got a framework of an application I prepared earlier. Just going to run it to show what happens. Maybe I've hidden the simulator. No, it's just coming slowly. Okay. So I think this is an ugly looking app. It has a connect button that says connect and a send message buffer that ends up in the receive message buffer. So that's not using Netcat yet. So let's add that in. So we have. Up here, we've used this async socket framework, and we have a property that is a socket. Um, so now when we hit the connect button, we're actually going to connect. So first of all, we're going to check that we're connected. And if we are connected, well, we want to disconnect. So we're going to allow it to toggle. Connect to host. So the fact that I'm using this pm air.local string here rather than an actual IP address like 129.78 or whatever, 
Um, this is part of the Bonjour spec, which I'm going to come to in the second part of the talk. So don't worry too much about it for now. So pull out 1 to 5 We're going to be dodgy and not check for errors. Um, this will work, right? OK, so once this connects, we want to receive the event that connects. So that's fine. We've got on socket did connect. So if we successfully connected, I'm just going to change my button. Uh, button. Yep, we're just going to highlight the button and then we disconnect. Did disconnect. So there is like much more error handling you can do in here, but I'm just not doing it for speed. Um, so I don't necessarily recommend this. OK, so we've got this going. I'm just going to check terminals, nothing running. OK. So if I hit connect, nothing's happened. Like, you know, the button lights up because I click on it, and then it disappears again. And that's because it's not actually connecting. You'll see it's still printing connect, connect. It's not actually doing anything. If I run a server in the background now, we hit connect. Yeah, yeah, button stays on. So that means that we've connected, and now we want to actually send some data. Cool. So you also notice if I kill the server, it'll just keep working. And that's to do with sockets and uh, the fact that they like to stay open just in case there's a problem with the network and the network resumes. And this is a cause of major nightmares. Um, Basically, you won't know that the socket has disconnected um, under some circumstances. Some you will, but let's just say it's painful. Anyway, so let's send some data. Well, let's receive some data, actually. So once we connect a host um, using this framework, we have to start reading data. Um, so I talked before about buffering. Uh, and the fact that you don't necessarily receive all your data in one big chunk. Like if you send a huge amount of data, it might get broken up into separate little packets. So this one has a convenience method that says read data to data. So I just want to read until I receive a line feed. Oops. Um, I, with a timeout, I'm going to go forever. And I don't, oops, wrong message. I think this is called tag. Again, there's a lot more here that I'm not using. Um, did read data. OK, so our data arrives at NS data packet. We're going to convert it into a string. Uh, is it NS string, string with data? NS string number string with data. Oh, yeah, thank you. I can never remember that one. Uh, data. And we're using ASCII string encoding. Nothing crazy there. OK, so self receive buffer. Oh, text. String. Uh, string. Ending. Ah, huh, it's a long one. OK, let's get this string. OK, so whoever managed to connect before, oh no, that's not going to work. It's the wrong way around. Um, let's do this again. So we've now connected to the host. I can type and I, we can receive one message. OK, so something's gone wrong there. What's actually happened is that this uh, read data is a one-off process. So we need to read data again after we receive to make sure we keep checking. So now if we do this, yay, OK. So we have data receiving. That's pretty good. It was actually pretty easy to do using that framework. We're also going to send data just for completeness. Um, so here we've got the text. We're going to go just going to tack a new line onto the end of that and get rid of that one. Right data. Now I've forgotten this one as well. Is it data using encoding? Yeah, it is. Okay. 
go connect. Hopefully we can send data, yay. And we can receive data. So that was like not very much code, really, to be honest. And we've got like a nice, um, yeah, an app here that we can send and receive messages across a, across a socket. So this is working on my local host, but if someone in the audience was to start a Netcat, does anyone ask to help? If someone was to start a Netcat server on their own computer, we could communicate with them pretty easily. Um, I'll show you. No, that's all I'm going to do on this demo for now. So let's close that one. I think. Yeah, we're there. Okay, so like I said before, this works really, really well for data channels. So we're sending, in our case, huge amounts of data. We can stream videos from the sensors over this connection. We stream laser scans. Um, we stream odometry, GPS information. Like, the actual socket itself doesn't care what data you send. We were sending ASCII text, but you can send binary data, um, and it's agnostic, really. Like, there's nothing that's going to stuff it up like that. Um, but if you're doing something like driving around a robot which weighs a couple of hundred kilograms and would probably kill you if it ran into you at full speed, um, requires a bit more safety than what we just have using these sockets for a few reasons. If you're using your iPhone to drive a robot around, then you've got some issues, possibly. So connections will drop. We have big issues with this all the time. If you're driving around a university trying to test and you've got 100 university students sitting around at lunchtime using their computers, you're all fighting for Wi-Fi bandwidth, basically, and your connections are going to time out, and that's going to be a pain. So you've got to deal with that. You might get a phone call. This is a funny one. So if I'm driving the robot around, and then someone calls me, then I get an alert pops up, and you've got to be careful. I'll show you what I mean about this in a second. Um, the app may get killed. The, if you hang or something like that, or you use too much memory, then there's always a chance your app is going to die for one reason or another. And you've got to be able to deal with this, of course. So a few strategies for actually coping with this. First one is heartbeats. So you just don't want to say, robot drive forward at speed 10 meters a second. <laughs> and then yeah, keep, keep doing that until I get another message. Because my next message saying, oh my god, stop, there's a tree in the way, might not get through, because my socket might have fallen apart. So one solution is heartbeats, which is to keep pinging the same request over and over again. So 10 times a second, for example, say keep driving at 10 meters a second forward. And then if you miss a heartbeat or you miss a couple of heartbeats, then you immediately stop the robot. It's a pretty simple thing. Second one is CRC, so checksums. Um, you can't, we, we talked about buffering and the way the data doesn't necessarily arrive all correctly. You want to really check that the data you're receiving is well formed and meaning a protocol. If you're just sending binary data over a channel, for some reason, if you drop a little bit of data and you lose your place in that stream, suddenly the command that said, don't go forward but turn it like 10 radians a second this way, might get translated to a drive 10 meters a second forward command, right? So you've got to like, make sure that the messages you receive are the right ones. And these are like lessons learned firsthand. Heartbeats, well, we knew to put that in before we started. CRCs. We didn't think it was going to be necessary, but it turned out to be very much the case. Final one is e-stops. We have another layer of security on this that's completely independent, um, and you do really want this if you're doing like serious kind of robotic operations. It's just mandatory that you have a safety system that's independent of any wireless problems. So we just have a wireless link that's a normally open connection. So as long as you maintain the link, the robot can drive. But the second something happens, like interference, you hit the button, the battery goes flat the robot will just stop. And that's like absolutely critical to have. I would, there's, like, if we didn't have an e-stop system, there was no way I'd ever consider driving the robots via an iPhone. There's too many things that just you may not have thought of that could go wrong, that you just need a real hard um, solution in there. So I'm going to do a quick demo just to say what I mean about that. Have we got something happening? Yeah, OK. So we have a nice little simulated world with a couple of robots here. We're going to. OK, so this is one version of the app that I've been using. So we've got a little pad here I can drive my mouse around and drive the robot. And so it's just sending um, yeah, velocity and turn rate commands. So this is great. I'm driving around. But I'm going to simulate, well, I can't simulate a phone call. Or can I? I'm, I can definitely simulate like a random lock screen there. So, whoops. So the screen just locked, but my robot's still driving. Um, so this is obviously a problem. And the same thing would happen if like, I got a phone call. So 
my robot's still driving. I'm in trouble. I've got to like re got to unlock my phone. Why did it rotate? Um, I've got to like reconnect to the robot, and then finally it'll stop, right? So that's not a good idea. We're going to get a crash. So Mantis, the other robot here, it's implemented some heartbeat stuff. So now I'm driving it around, and something happens, and my phone locks. Well, it stops immediately. So that's and that's the, the way it's working is I'm just sending my velocity commands 10 times a second. If I go uh, like 0.2 of a second without receiving a velocity message, I just set my velocity to zero. Pretty simple. One of the fun problems we had testing this just recently is we, um, we upgraded our robots to have far more torque in their, in their wheelbase systems. And there's a great bug where if you set the velocity, so if you set a velocity set point of zero, then the robot will automatically slow down obeying certain constraints to a speed of zero quite nicely. But if you just shut the connection off, then it would do an, like an emergency stop and it would hard lock the wheels. And we actually had enough torque in, um, in, in the system that my supervisor was using my app and driving it around. He got a phone call and the robot slammed on the brake so hard that the, the rear wheels actually lifted off the ground and it got pretty close to the tipping point. So that's not really a socket lesson, that's just an interesting anecdote that, yeah, be careful of the power of your robots. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to grab a drink and talk about bonjour. Okay, so if you ever use, if you do start using sockets, you'll find that there's a lot of IP addresses floating around, and these are uh, not fun. Um, and this is a screenshot from my application when I first developed it. Um, and so you have to set the host and the port number that you want to connect to. That's a standard part of sockets. And I went to um, Dub Dub this year, and in the talk about Bonjour, they put up a screenshot that looked almost exactly the same as this, and they said, this is what you don't do. Uh, <laughs> and so I realized there's a better way, and that's, that's good, because this is not the user-friendly kind of intuitive stuff that Apple would like you to use um, because you're fiddling around with these kind of settings which should be not exposed to the user. So the solution is Bonjour. So Bonjour um, is actually like it's an industry standard. It's called ZeroConf. Uh, it's implemented on Linux as, oh, it's not there. It's implemented on Linux as Avahi. Um, it's also available for Windows um, via Apple but for free, so it's usable by everyone. So it supports two things, um, service discovery and host name resolution. So host name resolution we've already seen. I said my host name was pmair.local, and so when whoever that was that netcatted into my session, they typed that in, the computer was using Bonjour as a service to uh, take that host name, translate that into an IP address, and then connect to that IP address. So that was working. And that's also the reason I can like, do that demo here, because if I do the demo at home, I'll have a different IP address if I want to connect to my computer. It's really frustrating to have to look in ifconfig, find the IP address, reconnect. Not fun. The other one is service discovery. So not just working out like, what the IP address of a given computer is, but working out what computers on the network are offering a service. So one might be iTunes sharing, for example, that uses Bonjour, um, Apple TV, so any of that sort of like you know, using an iPad AirPlay kind of stuff, that's all running on Bonjour. So we're going to look at that, how that works. So on a Mac, well, hang on. There's a command line version of this, so you can mess around with it on the command line. So this is now DNS SD is the command line name for Bonjour. What this whole string here is saying is it says um, DNS SD, register a service with the name Peter. It's got this... Uh, type string, it's running on the local domain on port 12345. So this part here is broken up into two, <coughs> two things. We have this identifier at the start, which is a unique name that advertises the name of my service. So I'm claiming to have the dev world service. And this one here is saying that the service is running over a TCP link. So UDP being the other obvious alternative. So there's these underscores going on here. This one is critical. I'm not, I don't understand why the underscores are there, but they're required. If you're running on a Linux machine, then to do the, exactly the same thing is to run a Vahi publish service. Um, so we can run this one as well. So I'm just going to 
Let's test something here. Okay, I'm just going to look at one of these. So another thing you do with DNSSD um, is actually discover what computers are around. So I just ran that. Uh, so DNSSD is browsing for services offering an SSH connection. Um, and so now we've found, we've got some instance names going on. You can see whether your computer's on this list. It doesn't mean that I can hack into your computer. It just means that I now know your computer's on the network, which is why, there you go. Um, so this is how um, like network discovery works. If you connect your computer via air sharing or something like that, this is the kind of stuff that it's using. So I don't know why I've got three servers running. But interesting. Um, oh, it's just local host and different loopback accounts. So there's actually a really interesting app for the iPhone. It's a free one. I think it's called Discovery. Um, and it's just implementing this on the iPhone so you can sit on your university network and just have a look at what services are available and you'll get like dozens and dozens and dozens of SSH accounts and um, you can see who's running Airtunes music sharing and stuff like that. So I was also going to do a demo, I think. Yeah. We'll see if this works. So can this is a crowd participation one again. Can people run something like this? Um, so where it says Peter, just change that to your own name. So you want to start instances of a dev world service. Um, whatever port number you like, I'm not going to use it, but just make up a port number um, and the local domain. Uh, yes. So it has to be called dev world because that's, I'm just going to browse for those services so we can see if we actually hit it. Let's open another one. Okay, there we go. Thanks, Douglas. <laughs> yeah, okay. So now you're, you're advertising your own services. I'm discovering those services. Um, so we could now theoretically go and connect to them or something. But I'm assuming none of you are actually running a server on these ports. So it's kind of useless information. So I guess that's an important consideration that um, I'm going to kill that before something happens. Uh, <laughs> It's an important consideration that this advertisement stuff is different from actually providing the service. So here you've said there's a service available on this port, but it might not actually be there. Um, cool. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing inside an iOS app. Okay, what have we got? Okay, so we've got a basic app here that doesn't, it's got a table view in it, and it's just listing Bonjour services. So we haven't actually plugged anything in, it's just a placeholder here. All right, so all this stuff is in net services, so NS net service stuff. So I'm going to first of all make um, well my class a net service browser delegate um, and create a net service browser. So there's some coding. Okay, so we've got a browser. Okay, so now we're going to tell the browser to actually start scanning for stuff. So this command here isn't dissimilar to the one I was running on the, just on the terminal, the command line. We're looking for services of type dev world in the local domain. So when this occurs, I'm going to get some callbacks. So let's handle them now. Um, did discover service, did find service. Oops, 
So interesting, there's a flag here on this method um, called more coming. And that's basically because you might discover a whole stack of services at the same time, and you'll get notified of them sequentially, like one at a time. So you don't want to have to reload your data or reload your table view for every single service if there's like a bunch of 10 coming in. So there's just a flag called more coming. You also get a notification when the service disappears. Um, did remove service, and it's essentially the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Okay, now let's see what happens. Hey, okay, so we have some services. <laughs> nice. So I'm going to register my own as well, just so you can see it. Oh, whoops. So you can see the latency is pretty good. So I just killed my service there, and you saw it disappear. And oh god, we got a lot now. <laughs> Lovely. Oh, I didn't. No, it didn't scroll through. Okay. So well, anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that, well, one that was pretty easy, and two, you get like the PETA service has popped up again, and it's probably going to disappear unless it's somebody else spoofing a PETA service, maybe. Uh, whatever, doesn't matter. So yeah, anyway, the idea is it's pretty easy to set yourself up to discover services, and then thanks. Oh god. Okay. So that's service discovery. We just um, you know d discovered all those services that exist, and we just know their names at the moment, and that's separate to resolution. So the first part of like the service discovery is you just want to find all the services available on your network and present a list of them to the user. Um, there's not that much information involved, it's sort of a one-way connection, you're just receiving notifications. The second part is resolution. So you have a service name and you want to actually resolve it to find out what the port number is, what the IP address is. Um, but you don't want to do this for every single service that's available to you. You only want to do it for the service you need to connect to because there's more bandwidth involved in this. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty simple thing, we just have to um, request the service to be resolved, so we've got a resolve with timeout going on there, and we'll get a callback when the resolution finishes. <coughs> okay, so. Ooh. No, no, that is good. That meant it happened right. Okay, so I just did a change in the background. Um, No, it's just taking a while. All right, I might close it, so again. Oh, yeah, we've crashed everything. Nice. <laughs> I'm very impatient with Xcode. Get to full screen. Hey, okay. Let's try that again. All right. Right again. Okay, so we're back to here. So if we click on the service that someone's published, we know the name of that service, and that's all we know. So I've got some boilerplate code going on in the detail controller that can, like, it's not really worth even mentioning too much, but it can print out name, host name, IP address, port. Um, but the thing is, it's not resolved. We haven't actually asked the service to resolve, so we're going to do that. So our detail controller needs to be a net service delegate. Um, and then did resolve, net service did resolve something. So when we did resolve it, we're just going to um, update our table view because the rest of the logic's in the table view itself. Reload data. Okay, so uh, the time that I want to actually start resolving is when you click on that link and you pop up this detail view. So here's one way to do it. I know that's a good one. Um, when I set the property, I'm just going to hack into that method and use it. Mm. We need a one-second timeout. Why not? Uh, so, ooh, hang on. 
I need a delegate first still. Eh, tight. Okay. Okay, so now look now we know your IP address as well as so you're in trouble. Um, yeah, so what's happened is that in the time between I clicked on the service and the table view popped up, it's actually gone and resolved the service, found out the IP address, the port number, your host name, um, and it's populated the table view with all that stuff. So service name resolution is in general, like very, very quick, but it is done as a callback. So like don't assume it's gonna be immediate, depending on your network, it may take a little bit. Is there anything else you can publish other than just an IP and a port? Yes, uh, so I don't have a demo on this. But so also in, in Bonjour, there's a thing called um, text fields where you can send arbitrary parameters. So you can say, like, in the case of, say, my Segway app, I might say maximum turn rate equals something or, like, CRC format equals whatever. And you can publish arbitrary fields in that packet. And this, you know, all of this framework has methods to resolve the text fields from that. But I'm not really going to talk about that now. Okay, so yeah, like I said when I introduced Bonjour, it is well supported, particularly across Apple platforms, and it is really commonly used. Um, look at iTunes, look at AirPlay, look at any number of Apple services, they really are using it. Um, so it makes a lot of sense not to actually ever type IP addresses. Most places on your phone that will request an IP address will also take like a Bonjour service and automatically resolve it for you. Um, you notice in my first demo when I was trying to connect to a socket, I just gave it the bonjour address, which was .local. Um, yeah, so the host name of your machine, um, .local, is your bonjour address, and you can use that. Um, so definitely think about using it for um, connected apps. Um, if anybody's used, uh, what's it called, Subether Edit or Coda, that's all based around using bonjour for service discovery. Um, I've got a finance app called Skrill that synchronizes my phone to my laptop. And it does that by publishing a service and discovering that service and connecting. Um, and if you ever fire up like a generic service browser on a network, you'll just discover there's tons and tons and tons of different services there. Um, the one important thing is if you actually publish an app that makes use of this, then you need to register your service name. So that underscore dev world is something I just made up. I'm just assuming it's got no collisions here at the moment. Um, but I wouldn't get away with this on the App Store. There's actually, um, it's free to register. Um, it's just one of the internet advisory groups maintains a list, a mapping between um, service names and who actually uses them. So, like all the the known services like iTunes and AirPlay and stuff have fully registered names, and you would need to have your own if you decided to publish. Okay, so now we're switching a little bit. We've been talking about sockets and internet streams and stuff like that, and now we're going to talk about Bluetooth low energy. And this was what I thought was the most exciting thing of all of um, Dub Dub this year, was I went to two sessions on Bluetooth and I thought it's really, really exciting. Particularly from my background where I'm interested in communicating between like a device and some actually integrated electronics. Um, I don't want to be generating Wi-Fi networks, I don't want to join the made for iOS peripheral like developer program, um, but I do want communications between electronics and hardware. So this is great because you don't need to be the made for iPod program um, you don't need to be a registered peripheral developer, but you can still make peripherals. Um, so it's for low range, low bandwidth communications. If you know Bluetooth, you know it's supposed to be low range, but Bluetooth low energy is even like it's tiny, tiny bandwidth. You're not supposed to be sending truckloads of data. It's more to do things like sensors. So you have a temperature or a heart rate monitor, something that's updating, say, once every second, and it's just spitting out an integer or a float. Like, that's the kind of level of service we're talking about. We're not talking about, like, doing audio to your headphones or something like that. That's not Bluetooth low energy. And it's called low energy because it uses an extremely tiny amount of energy. So the price, like, the price you pay for using low energy is you have low bandwidth, but because you have such low power, people are quoting things like running it off a watch battery for two years kind of thing. You know, you, if you think about Bluetooth, you normally like, well, I'll turn that off because if I leave Bluetooth on, my phone will go flat really quick. This is the kind of Bluetooth that you just leave on and it won't cause the problems. So like I said, it's perfect for um, sensors and peripherals and sort of heart rate monitors is the real kind of 
application that people like to talk about. Um, it's built into the 4S and above uh, the new iPad, the Retina iPad. Um, the new MacBook Air, the new MacBook Pros, I think, have it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's growing. It's kind of like Apple's um, NFC solution. I'm not sure whether they're going to get NFC, but this is another way of doing something similar. I'm just going to say for now, I don't um, have an iPhone 4S. I have an iPhone 4, so I can't do any iOS demos. Um, so the demos I'm going to do are based in the, on the Mac, um, but the, the frameworks are almost identical across both platforms. So if you have a device, you should be able to use it pretty easily. Um, so yeah, a couple of devices. So this one on the left, um, yeah. So there's a number of companies actually making um, Bluetooth low energy devices now. This is based on a Texas Instruments chip, um, so it's getting some traction. Um, Blue Giga is just one company I happen to find that actually make devices. So I also have with me here um, two USB devices. Um, so these just look like your standard Bluetooth nub kind of things, but these are actually Bluetooth low energy. Um, of course, because they're in a USB housing, they still need 5 volts and they you know, take a bit more power. So they're not really low energy, but they're following the same spec. Um, and they're identical, um, functionally identical to this kind of module, which you can see compared to a watch battery. It's pretty tiny. Oops. So the concepts of Bluetooth low energy is that you have centrals and peripherals. So something like a central is something like your laptop. Um, it's scanning for devices, and it wants to receive data. On the other hand, you have a peripheral, which is advertising the fact that it exists and it has data available. Um, and generally, the communications is mostly this way. So the, at the Apple conference, they're talking about things like you might have a thermostat on the wall of a building that's just advertising the fact that I know the temperature in this room. And the idea is that anybody else in the room that is interested to find out that temperature can just log into that sensor and get the information. What's interesting is that the iPhone is in both of these pictures, and that's pretty cool. So it means that the iPhone can act uh, one way, it can act as a, as a central, so I could be using my iPhone to poll for temperature sensors in this room, but I can also offer my services from my iPhone to my Mac, so I can be using this yeah, as, a, as a peripheral and giving data back to my laptop. Yeah, well you don't want to synchronize over this rack because it's very, very low bandwidth. Um, okay, so now we're going to do a demo to do with how we discover services. And what you're going to notice as I code this demo is that it's really, really similar to the Bonjour demo in a number of ways. And so I suspect that similar people are involved in writing the frameworks. Um, but it's a, it's a really neat framework. If you've ever tried to play with um, Bluetooth before, Bluetooth is not particularly friendly for developers, uh, but this very much is. Um, not really. We'll talk about that. So these, well, okay, I'll explain what I have in the code so far. I have, both of these devices have UUIDs in them, so I've just given them names. Uh, this one's called Pi because it was going to be plugged into my Raspberry Pi, but then I discovered that I can't plug in a projector screen and an Ethernet adapter at the same time, so I didn't bring my Raspberry Pi. Um, this bit, like, this is the entire code of the program so far. Uh, we start a, oh yeah, we have it here, we have a manager, which is called a CB central manager, it's using the core Bluetooth framework, um, and then when we start it running, we'll get a state notification telling us, excuse me, about the state of the Bluetooth. So Bluetooth is powered off, that's good. I turn it on, and now Bluetooth is powered on. So, like, as far as frameworks go for receiving notifications like that, that's pretty clean. I kind of like that. Um, so now let's start discovering. So Oops. Okay, so we're telling the manager to scan for peripherals with services. I say nil here, and nil is a special value that means discover everything. Um, this is explicitly not recommended by Apple, and the reason is that there's a very clear spec for defining what peripherals provide which services and which, which peripherals you might want to connect to. So 
you don't want to waste your battery power scanning the room for everything when all you want to know is the temperature in the room. So what you really should do here is um, search for a specific service we'll talk about in a moment. But I'm just going to search for everything. And then we get a notification when that happens. So central to discover peripheral. Um, Okay, so this is where the yeah, UUIDs are really big in Bluetooth Low Energy. Everything is, gets represented by UUIDs. So at the moment, if we discover a peripheral, I'm just going to log it, just to show what happens. So I've got one of my youth, uh, USB devices and an enormous battery pack, because it's the only way I could power it. Um, so I'm just going to plug that in, turn it on. And you saw immediately I turned it on, and we've got this notification down the bottom here. So this is not exactly the low energy solution, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so, well, I'm just going to do something gimmicky, and because we've got these UUIDs that we already know, you can see this one here matched up, pretty sure, yeah, to that one there. So we can just display a welcome message, why not? Uh, no. And the weird thing is that I just discovered the other day is that UUIDs passed around by the Bluetooth framework are slightly different to the UUIDs it wants to use internally, so you have to translate them. Um. We can log it anyway. Let's just keep that log. <laughs> okay, so this doesn't really do anything more exciting than the last demo. Uh, other than fail. <laughs> well done. Um, oh, I know, it's not the message, it's the string value. There we go. Okay, so once you get this kind of thing working, you begin to start to think of ideas about how this sort of stuff could be useful. Because imagine I have my peripheral sitting on my iPhone, and I walk into my house, and it can suddenly say, welcome, Peter. Or it can do anything I like. It can turn on the lights. It can start some music playing. Um, it's kind of good. So what, what that did is if we, well, let's try and run that demo again. Um, oops. So I'm going to run all the way over here. It's not very, I haven't actually tested out the maximum range of this, but it's like, it's enough that that's going to work. So that's not quite the effect that I'm after when I walk into my room. I don't want to walk into my house and start the music blaring. I want it to be a bit more subtle than that. So, exactly, I want to be close up to my computer before this happens. So we're going to do a couple of things. OK, so remember how we had resolution before. So we had a bonjour service, we discovered it, but we didn't know much about it until we resolved it. This is quite similar to something we're going to do with um, Bluetooth peripherals here. So we're going to store peripheral. I can't see. Peripheral. Uh, so we're going to be a peripheral delegate as well. We're going to handle it all in this one module, which is not necessarily a good idea. But. OK. Okay, so I just did something called read RSSI. So, can anyone remem remind me what this is? Root squared signal intensity, I think. So, yeah, uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this is to do with signal strength. So, for something like a Wi Fi network or a Bluetooth, we're just measuring uh, like the amount of energy we put out, we know approximately. So, by measuring how much energy we get in, we can get an approximation for range. So this allows us to do something cool. So uh, oh, we're going to do a couple of things differently now. Oh, crap. No. 
Okay, that's not how we do it. So, central, what do I call it? Manager. Um, oops. CD. So, One of these annoying CB. Uh, oh, yes, okay. One of the horribly long names. Um, okay, so I got that wrong. We're not going to read the RSSI yet. First step is to connect to the peripheral, which is like that resolution step I was talking about. I'm oh, running out of time. Um, so this one here just says that we're also going to get a notification when we disconnect from the peripheral. So when we connect, central manager did connect peripheral. Um, so here we set our message to yeah, I should have copied that. Um, oh, username, we don't have that either. Damn it. Maybe we do. Oops, LA. And now we're going to read the RSSI. And, ooh, and now we have peripheral did update RSSI. Okay, so we've got a special value which is minus 127. So if we get minus 127, which is, seems to be not red, or RSSI, this is minus 40. We're just going to read it again. So there's some really hacky coding happening. Okay, so now we have a two-step process here where if we plug this guy in, first step it's going to say hello when it discovers. Uh, nope. No, 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 we've got, oh yeah, I did that again. Thanks. Sometimes I just need to reboot. Okay, so it's saying hello, but that's not the same message. I want to say welcome when I get close enough. So if I scan close to the computer here. Oh, I didn't copy that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> We're getting there. Let me change it. Okay, now we've got a welcome. So we plug it in. We say welcome. That's interesting. That's not the same lesson. Okay, we're also going to log our. Yeah, normally I could be like, I have to get a couple of centimeters away from it. So let's try that again. <laughs> if I okay, hang on. There's a better solution here. We'll just, one we prepared earlier. I thought about that. Um, <laughs> I want to show it because it's cool. <laughs> All right. Existing code detected, and then we get close enough, and it says welcome. Cool. So I'll just show that again. I'm not going to disconnect. Okay. So we're scanning for devices. I'll just demonstrate this again. So I've walked into my house, and it knows I'm in my house, um, but it's not until I get close my battery goes flat. There we go. <laughs> we can hurt stuff. Cool. So there's the idea. Um, so we can play around with that RSSI value to actually sort of get the approach we want. Like you can lock your computer when you walk four steps away from it, these kind of ideas. So 
that's the idea. So I think I'm, whoops, time-wise, I'm just going to skip this because it's not the main point. Uh, so, well, the main point here is that characteristics are organized, um, a lot of them by the Bluetooth specification itself. So those EUID values um, that I was talking about, there's specific ones for, say, a heart rate sensor, for a temperature monitor, um, for a whole bunch of different things. So the idea of this is that you have a common protocol, common EUIDs, which means there's open access. So the goal of this standard is that if you're a temperature sensor and you're advertising the fact that you know about temperature, you're not locked into a specific device or a specific API or toolkit or software chain. You should just be able to access that device. So that's really powerful because it means you can buy a heart rate sensor and plug it into your Android phone, your iPhone, your laptop, and it's just open for everybody. Um, yeah, so we're going to skip those last demos. So um, if you want to get started with Bluetooth for LE, don't need any hardware other than the Apple stuff you assumedly already own. So if you've got a new iPhone or a laptop, you can do it straight away. If you want to play around with custom peripherals, this one's from Blue Giga. Um, I'm not sure that I recommend it. It kind of works, but it's a bit annoying. Um, they've got also like much more hardcore development boards that let you plug into serial pins and ports and values and displays and stuff. Well, this one's interesting. Um, this is a Kickstarter project that just got funded. It's building an Arduino shield um, for Bluetooth Low Energy. So that's pretty cool as well. It's, so these are all pretty good because it means you should now be in an opportunity where you can actually build custom hardware via Arduino for your iPhone um, and get it happening without having to worry about the made for iPhone program. So just point out some resources. Um, there were three sessions that overlap this one quite heavily at DubDub. Um, they're worth checking out for a bit more details. Um, and then that's the socket library I was talking about. Cool, that's a lot. Thanks very much. <laughs>